Talking today to Andy Curry, who is a director of the Futures Company. It's a consultancy company that provides foresight and futures for its clients. Andy, why don't you here today to talk about futurology and try and understand what this discipline involves. Leaving aside seers and profits, what's the start of futurology in the modern period? Um, well, we call it futures usually rather than futurology. Um, I think that's just so it uh, seems slightly less geeky, to be honest. Um, the start of the modern period really is two, two um, strands to it, really. One is it goes back to um, Herman Kahn and uh, his interpretation of the Cold War. Um, he certainly developed uh, scenarios practice. Um, looking at scenarios of nuclear war. He was looking at scenarios of nuclear war. He was trying to help people think about the unthinkable. Um, but there's also quite another rich strand which goes back, um, interestingly goes back to the peace movement um, and uh, visions of uh, a world in which there are no nuclear weapons in which uh, people like Frank Polak, uh, people like Robert Junk, and uh, people like Elise Boulding worked with community groups and activist groups to, to develop visions. And there's a kind of two strands of futures work between the um, scenarios which tend to be possible futures and visions which tend to be preferred futures. And sometimes scenarios can help you to get to visions. Preferred. Sometimes they don't. And in your view, who, who have been the really influential futurists? The... Yes, whether, whether the ones who have been influential should have been influential is a different question. But uh, in terms of business futures, Pierre Vac at Shell was um, really kind of the father of everybody who does any work with businesses now. He was the person who brought um, futures work into Shell. Um, famously, um, his work of scenarios for futures of the oil price helped Shell imagine what the world would be like if the oil price went up quickly and ride the um, 1970s price spike much better than their, their competitors. Um, more recently, um, Peter Schwartz, who again another Shell alumni, um, came out of Shell, set up the Global Business Network. You know, everybody who uses a two-by-two -two scenario is really sort of treading in the uh, steps of um, Peter Schwartz. Um, I think there's some problems with those, those methods, but um, nonetheless, I think when you look back in terms of business futures work, those two are probably the people who um, have cast the longest shadow on the, on the business. What's the track record of futurists for actually foretelling what did happen? Well, I think the first thing that futurists get taught when they're proto-futurists is that um, we're not in the business of prediction. There are no future facts. Um, so, generally, the track record's actually not bad, but it's not about predicting. The point is actually, there's a famous um, quote from, French, from the early French futurist, a man called Gaston Berger, and uh, he said the, um, the purpose of looking at the um, future is to disturb the present. So actually, when you're working with a client on a, a futures project, the point is to... Uh, really to shape their view of the landscape in which they're working in. To challenge their assumptions. To challenge their assumptions, to actually look beyond the, their operating environment, the contextual environment. And, you know, broadly speaking, you can, um, you know, when you're doing that, whether you're doing that through scenarios or through trends analysis or through any of the other techniques, you do tend to be spotting the patterns that emerge. Um, you don't tend to be necessarily spotting them on the right time frame, and you don't tend to be spotting them on the exact um, the exact construction that actually mm. they, they turn out but you know if you if I look back at the scenarios I was working with clients on in the first half of the uh, last decade you know, they've all got a crash scenario in them because you could see then that uh, you know the debt levels were rising that the oil price was going to start spiking we didn't know that much about the um how badly um the banks uh, were exposed, but mm. even without those things, you could see that levels know, so levels of debt were going to become a problem. Absolutely. So yeah. you know, so pretty much all of the scenario sets we did from 2002, 2001 onwards have got some sort of recession crash scenario. In them, for example, how do you go about telling clients what's going to happen in the future? What's what's the methodology for looking at these issues? Well, there's different methodologies. Um, I think generally. 
there's quite a complex process that goes on here. If we go away and write a report for a client and give it back to them, they are not going to do anything with it. So, you know, I sometimes write about the uh, fact that actually what's going on here is a process of social construction. I don't want to get too sociological about mm. that. But, you know, unless you're engaging the client in working through the issues, unless they're actually participating in the work, it really doesn't matter what you do, you know, you're never going to have any impact. Mm. So, effectively, what we end up doing is we end up in a... You're persuading the client, in effect. I don't think we're persuading. I think we're allowing them to... Um, Face the same questions. It. Absolutely. I mean, Pierre Bach had a phrase which he used in Shell about uh, scenarios being about the gentle art of reperceiving. And he saw his task as mm. a futurist in Shell as to get the Shell managers to reperceive the world around them. I mean, he used very extreme methods like sort of meditation and... Uh, you know, things like things like that to help him reperceive the world. I don't think you get away with that these days. Um, so what you're doing is you're effectively using a set of tools. I'll come back to those in a minute. To and then working with the client in you know workshops and working sessions to get them to sort of internalise issues, to work things through them themselves, to actually sort of do that reperceiving in the in, in that in, in that a productive way. way. In a productive way, yes. But, but I mean, should I just carry what, what disciplines do you use to tell things? Because those are the tools, effectively, aren't those, they? Well, yeah, I think the, the, the core of all um, futures work really is around um, the, base, the base work is about drivers, understanding drivers of change. And to get to those, you'll be looking at... Um, social issues, social movements, you'll be looking at economic changes, you'll be looking at technology. Um, you'll clearly be looking at um, environmental changes. Although interestingly, you know, s still people talk about pest as a driver scam, mm. which leaves environmental issues out completely. You'll be looking at some um, political and regulatory change. Typically you'll also be trying to understand the specific issues in their particular sector. And what that starts allowing you to do as you start looking at these different Forces for change. Some futurists also stress the importance of barriers, uh, blockers. Um, as you start building a map of the sorts of uh, things which combine to uh, create create the landscape they're operating in. I mean, I think probably futures has got quite a lot of connections to um, systems work. But you know, system thinking has got such a bad reputation because it's so hard to understand mm. that we tend to sort of slide that under the table a bit. But actually, when you look at a lot of the practices and a lot of the methods and a lot of the connections that get made, effectively we're doing kind of soft systems thinking, but without admitting that to the client. It's how things interact with each other, yes, isn't it? Right. You're trying to get to the interactions. Yeah. Economists struggle with irrational, inverted commas, human behaviour. How do you deal with the fact that we often behave very differently from the way we are supposed to or we might? There's quite an animated um, debate inside futures about this, actually. Um, because actually, if you look at the, um, the sh a lot of the shell methods, tended to regard the only important drivers of change as being high-level structural drivers of change. So, you know, they would look, for example, at the fact there was a significant aging population in the world, but they wouldn't look at the values that were associated with that. So, you know, the fact that mm. older people no longer behave like they used to behave when I was younger, um, that would get get a bit lost. So, there's quite a sort of an animated uh, discussion in the field about. How do you incorporate values? How do you incorporate issues of consciousness into the scan that you're doing when you're sort of looking for drivers of change? And how do you then incorporate those into your understanding of the work that you're doing? Um, and there's actually a specific model that's been developed. There's quite a rich um, Australian school of futurists who are kind of very um, engaged by this. They've drawn on the uh, work of Ken Wilber around integral methods of understanding to actually sort of make sure that values and changes in consciousness and changes in ideas do get incorporated into the overall look. And those those tend to deal with that kind of issue about rationality, that actually you're starting to understand how people feel as well as um, how they act. Mm. And, but there's a kind of a, a layer to that, which is you know, quite often when you have a scenario and you present a scenario to a group of clients where the fundamental driver has been a shift in values, they tend to disbelieve it. You know, that People are much more believing in futures if they can see the changes, external force. Changes in market share. Absolutely. absolutely. Or, yeah. you know, or a piece of technology, say. Yeah. You know, when you say hard, that, hard rather than soft. Yeah. When you say to them, actually, there's likely to be a shift of values. At the moment, for example, I believe there's quite likely there's going to be a shift of values from 
the more individual culture we've had for the last 30 years to a much more community-oriented culture. There's actually quite a lot of signs of that, and there's quite a lot of theory that would support that. But clients will sometimes resi resist that. You know, they, they're used to thinking of the rise of individualism as being a key mm. trend, you know, if they've looked at the trend stacks, which they've had circulating in their businesses. They find it very hard to sort of imagine that world. Well, you referred earlier to the dividing line between telling what might actually happen and the hoped-for future. How do you deal with that? In it's, I don't know, the, uh, it's um, a bit like um, pessimism of the spirit and optimism of the will. Really, you have to be very honest with a client about the, the shape of the landscape, whether they mm. like it or not. You have to be really. Um, it's sometimes quite confrontational with them and say, actually, this is what the drivers tell us. Um, you know, some of this you don't like very much, but this is what the drivers tell us. Once you've done that, you can then start saying, and if you want to um, navigate towards this um, preferred future, you know, there are these things which are in its favour, the, these things which are pushing against it, there are these um, opportunities attached to that, there are these risks. You know, actually. Often the, um, the preferred future is driven by values anyway, mm. rather than necessarily the more structural and the more um, analytical work that's gone into the understanding of the landscape. So it's, you know, people sort of quite often get to their vision quite intuitively, but then the, work, the hard work is actually understanding what that means in terms of what you're actually doing in terms of making mm. the strategic choices. To what extent do you produce sets of assumptions and scenarios? In other words, you paint different futures in order for people to understand the relationship that you're talking about? Typically when you're looking at a set of scenarios, you're, you're breaking the world into two or three groups of ideas. Um, the first group is uh, what we call contexts, the things which are going to happen regardless of which scenario happens. So they tend to be, in scenarios language, they tend to be important and relatively certain, nothing's absolutely certain. But you know, and obviously, mm. I was talking earlier about demographic change, for example. You know, some of the best data we have is on demographic change. Mm. You know, almost every scenario you do, that's a kind of a context-setting piece of work. And then what you're looking at is also the things which are important but uncertain. And you're, depending on which scenarios methods you're using, mm. you're either understanding combinations of uncertainty or ranges of uncertainty. And those are the things which actually, having set the contexts, um, the thing, are the things which make difference, you know, within scenario sets, you know, you're typically mm. looking at three to four to sometimes five scenarios, and those scenarios are pulled apart by the uncertainties, the important uncertainties that are, are going on. And how do you use these scenarios to help clients understand change? Um, well, the clients use them themselves to understand yeah. change, you know, that's, we, we help them. Yeah. Um, typically, what you're hoping you've got with a set of scenarios is um, some pictures of possible future worlds which represent a canvas, you know, and they're pushed out towards the edge of the canvas. You know, they don't necessarily need to be tent packs, but mm. they're, they're, you know, they have a range, they're broadly different. And what you're um, doing when you work through those with clients by looking at what does that world feel like for your business, what are the issues for your business in that world, you're helping them to think more broadly than they normally think in terms of their usual operating environment. Now, one of the things we often say is that actually, um, you know, when you look at a set of scenarios, parts of those scenarios are likely to mm. come to pass in different markets or in different places. They're very rarely you know, cast iron. Yeah. yeah, and they're also very rarely cast iron alternatives mm. as well. You know, sometimes they'll, or one scenario will be picked up by one group in one market in one particular mm. set of conditions, and a different scenario will have much more resonance somewhere else. Um, but there's also tools you can use once you have a set of scenarios. Um, it's called wind, technical wind tunneling, mm. where actually if you have a set of preferred strategic choices or policy choices, you can actually look at how those influence the outcome of the scenarios and therefore whether they, they're actually going to be effective or not or whether they produce unintended consequences.